Well, hello and welcome to Rivers United Church Online. My name is Eric and I get to be a part of Rivers United Church by serving as one of the two co-lead pastors. My counterpart, John, is going to be kicking things off here uh, in just a few moments with a brand new series that we're launching today called Do Over, Responding to the Changes in Life. But before we get into that, we wanted to say thank you for joining us online. We realize that there are a lot of options you have available right now to you of things that you can be watching on your screen. So the fact that you've decided to spend this time with us means an awful lot to us. So thank you so much. Now, real quick, a tool I want to let you know about is our virtual connection card. This is available 24 seven for you to fill out, to let us know about any questions you have, prayer requests you have, something you would like to request information about. It's just a great, powerful tool that you can use to make sure you're reaching out to us and letting us know how we can help you right now. So the connection card, you can click on connection card or visit the website anytime during the week to find that. Now, I also wanted to just say thank you to everyone who has been stepping up and stepping out with us through partnering with us and continuing to partner with us in your online giving. It's amazing to me that we have people starting to give for the very first time. And that is just, I'm so proud of you and thank you for doing that. Um, it gives us the opportunity as a church to step into new places, to partner with new organizations, to do things right now and in the future to respond to those in need, to respond to your neighbors, your coworkers, your family, your friends, and even you. So we've got a couple different ways set up for you to be in partnership with us on giving. Right now in your phone, and where you would normally put the phone number in a text message, just put the numbers 84321. And then where you would type the text message, type in any amount. Um, just, you know, 84321, put in 20. 84321, and then down in the message area, put 50 whatever it might be. Now, if you'd like to know more about how the text to give works, um, how you cancel a, a, a text to give um, or anything like that, or all the other ways we have for you to give, head over to our website, riversunited.church forward slash give. We also have resources there to help you if you're having some financial challenges right now. So all of that can be found on the website. Hey, I want to let you know that if you're feeling a little disconnected right now, you're not alone. Um, if, if you're starting to feel like, hey, the people that I live with, like I love them, but I have to start reminding myself every day I love them um, because it's like they're the only people I'm talking to. I really need some other connections right now in my life, but because of the stay at home order, I ain't getting it we have got some online community groups for you. So all you need to do is, um, if you're watching on the computer, uh, either above this video or below it, you'll see the word groups. Just click on that and you'll be taken to a form. It's a real simple form to fill in and we will get you connected with some of our online community groups. Well, again, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being online with us. Make sure you share right now on social media that you're watching this. Invite your friends and neighbors in to join. And as I said, our co-lead pastor, John Hunter, is kicking off a four-week series today, Do Over. So with that, let's turn things over to Pastor John Hunter. Welcome to Rivers United Church. We're so glad that you are here today. And uh, welcome to Church Online. Uh, we really wish we could be together in person, but this is the next best thing. And it's fulfilling kind of a dream of mine, in a way. <laughs> um, I've always wanted to have all you guys over to my house, and so in a way, where I'm inviting you into my home. And uh, I had intended to do this outside. That's why I said, in a way. Uh, but every time I went out on the deck, there was dogs barking in the neighborhood. Uh, that got very loud. And then the sun was beating down on the camera and it was overheating it. And so anyway, I had to come back inside, which is fine. But we, I welcome you to my home. We welcome you to our church. And we're so glad that you're part of this service today. Today, we're starting a brand new series called Do Over. Do Over. Uh, in golf, they call it a mulligan. <laughs> I'm not very good at golf. And so uh, I know exactly what mulligans are. And it's when you get to do the whole over. Some of us wish we could do that in our life. Have a mulligan or a do over for our lives. 
And in this series, we're going to be talking about, over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about some principles on how can we do that? How can we get a fresh start? But more than that, how can we get our life going in the right direction? And with saying that, is there principles from God's Word? And so what we're going to do is we're going to share with you four principles from four different main characters in the Bible to share with you these principles that can help you get your life on track, no matter what you're facing in this life. We know right now we're facing a world pandemic that's changing everything, and we have no idea what the future holds, and this will prepare us for that. But, but not just for this time. These are timeless principles that can change our lives. And so today, we're going to start with one of the most famous people in all of the Bible, if not one of the most famous people in all of the world, and his name is Abraham. In fact, we find him in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. And so what I want to tell you is, is I would recommend take some notes because here's the thing I know, you're going to want to come back to this and wrestle with this and share this and use this in your life in all different seasons of your life. So, so uh, in, in next to your stuff online is a little place that says notes and you can click on that and you can look at notes or you can write down some notes, but I would highly recommend taking some, okay? So Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, which is the same as Abraham, they just changed his name later. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people from your father's household to a land that I will show you. We'll skip down to verse 4. It says, So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So let me give you just a little bit of background on the life of Abraham. Abraham lived in ancient times. He lived around 4,000 years ago, give or take a couple hundred years. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of hard to say when you go back in ancient times. He lived in Mesopotamia, which is the cradle of civilization in an area there known as Ur, uh, Ur of the Chaldeans. Uh, his father was believed to be an idol carver. Um, they worshipped many gods in Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, and so did his father. But it's believed that somewhere along the line, Abram came to faith in God. And when he did, he stopped worshipping all these other idols and worshipped only the true God. Uh, he was a very successful man. He was wealthy. He, um, he had a lot of wisdom. Uh, the people in his area had a lot of respect for him. And he was a family man who took care of his family. And right in the middle of what you consider, hey, he's 75 years old. He's getting more to the end of his journey. Um, he wasn't able to have any children. God came to him and called him and, and changed his life just out of the blue. In fact, that's kind of what we want to talk a little bit about today. That as we look at, at getting our life on the right track, there's something we have to understand about God that's going to help us with our lives. Because if you don't get this, you're never going to really understand life. You're not going to understand faith. And you're not going to be successful in the way that Abraham was. And that's this. That God's favorite technique in life, you know what it is? It's surprise. <laughs> How many people like that, right? Sometimes I do, right? If it's a good one. Or if it's something that I'm part of. But I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I just wish that God would come to me and say, Hey, it would be a lot easier if you would just explain the whole thing to me, God. And then I would know what to do. But that the truth is, is that's not the way it works. We see that all throughout the Bible. And in Abraham's life, the reason why he was blessed by God is because even though he didn't know, in fact, that's what it says in the book of Hebrews. If we look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, if you want to write that down or look in your outlines, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, that's called the Faith Hall of Fame. That's what we consider this passage because it has great men and women of faith are listed in Hebrews chapter 11. And Abraham comes at the very beginning of that passage. It says in, in verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. You know what that tells me? Abraham was blessed by God because he was willing to leave and do what God said, even though he didn't have the plan. He was a great man of faith, not because he had the plan, but because he trusted in God. This is so important. That's why he was such a great man of faith, and he became one of the greatest men that the world's seen. He, he's the father of the nation of Israel. In fact, he's the father of almost all of the Middle East, to be quite honest. But here's the thing. Abraham became an incredible man of faith, and the whole world was blessed through him and the nation of Israel when Jesus Christ was born. Uh, it was, it's an amazing thing because Jesus comes through that lineage, and so Abraham blessed the entire world. But if you want to know where that started, it started with a journey where God called him and Abraham went. That's, that's where it starts. 
It's a principle found all throughout the Bible. Here's what Abraham didn't do. Abraham didn't go out and he didn't, he, he didn't wait after he heard what God said. He didn't say, well, let me think about that for a while. He did exactly what God called him to do. Abraham didn't go out and take a poll and say, hey, what does everybody think? He knew what God had said and he decided to do it. He went against, honestly, conventional wisdom. And he leaned hard into God, not his own plan. Now, I know that's going to be hard for some of us that are control freaks. <laughs> That we want God to give us the plan and then we'll finally be okay. But if you get this, it's, it could possibly change your life. Now, this is where we separate out a little bit from self-help. It's not that this is not practical, but it's not saying, hey, look within and God will do this and you can name it and claim it. It's saying, no, it's the exact opposite. That God has a plan. If you'll listen to it and you'll do it, you could be blessed by God just like Abraham was. <laughs> I'll give you another verse in the Bible you can write down if you want to. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. He'll make your path clear. But it's not in you knowing the plan. It's in you following what God is telling you to do each step of the way. What God is basically saying is he's saying, Hey, take a step, and then I'll tell you what's next. That's exactly what he did in Abraham's life. He didn't say, Abraham, I want you to go to this place. What he said was, I want you to go in that direction, and I'll tell you when you get there. <laughs> you want to know the keys to life? That's the key to life. Embracing what God is saying. Do the next step, and then God will meet you right where you are. <laughs> so important. So important to our lives. So what I'd like to do is this. is I'd like to simply just give you a few other examples so you can see that it's not just Abraham's life that we're talking about here. This is a principle found all throughout the Bible. So I'm going to give you a couple of them just to do. So I'm, we're going to fast forward from the time of Abraham and go to his great-grandson, Joseph, who was born into uh, Abraham's family later. And, uh, and so Joseph came at a time, and God gave Joseph a vision that said, hey, you're going to be a great man and you are going to bless the entire world, and everybody's going to look up to you. And uh, unfortunately, what Joseph did was he went and told his older brothers, and uh, if you have older brothers, they would usually beat you up like mine would. And, uh, and so that's exactly what they did, but they took it a step further. The family was kind of dysfunctional, and they actually sold him into slavery. And he became a slave in Egypt. For, for decades, quite honestly. And, and he actually was falsely accused of another crime in Egypt, and he ended up into a prison, not seeming that, that the calling that God gave him would come to pass, yet God orchestrated the events. And what happened? That, that Joseph ends up interpreting a dream for Pharaoh, <laughs> and it saves the entire world from famine. What I want you to see today is this, is that in Genesis chapter 50, when, 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 it, when his brothers come, right? They don't even know who he is. It's been almost two decades since they've seen him. And now he's in charge, Joseph is in charge of the entire world, and he decides who eats and who doesn't. His brothers come, and they're terrified when they find out it's Joseph, because they're like, we did such bad things to you, you'll probably kill us and our families. And Joseph said, no, I'm not. I don't hold a grudge, because here's the thing. You meant it for evil. This is in Genesis chapter 50, if you want to look it up. You meant it for evil, but God intended it for good for the saving of many lives. That even when we can't understand what God is doing, God is at work. And Joseph understood it, and it blessed the entire world because he took the next step that God had given him. That's exactly what we want for you today as well. That's one more example. We fast forward a little bit further to the time of Jesus Christ when he came and he started to select his disciples way before going to the cross. He decided to select his closest followers who would do life with him and he would leave them to start the church and all those kinds of things. Um, the first place he went was down by the Sea of Galilee. And when he was down at the Sea of Galilee, he selected fishermen. My brother said that. That's because fishermen are the best. And if you're out there watching uh, this message from your, your boat, that's, that's awesome. Because Jesus loves fishermen. That's true. And so he called fishermen to himself. And, uh, and so, so they felt pretty good about themselves until Jesus left there. And he went down into the middle of the city, right, away from the countryside or right away from the, the coast. And he, and he got down right into the middle of the city into like a bad section, right, where people live. And he even went to a worse section where the tax collectors live, right? There's sinners, and then you get to a section where there's tax collectors. And even today, we're not real fine with tax collectors. Is that right? If you had to pay taxes this year, and I know it was just tax day just a few days ago, we're like, we're not so fond of them today either. <laughs> and so Jesus goes down to where they collected the taxes. These guys that that were sellouts, right? I mean, they actually swindled people out of money. They, they gave money to Rome, but they also would keep a lot for themselves. And he goes up to one of them named Matthew. 
And he says to Matthew, come follow me. And the disciples are thinking to themselves, you've got to be kidding, right? Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9 is where Jesus calls Matthew, if you want to read that for yourself. And he says, come follow me. Later that same day, Jesus was in Matthew's house with many sinners and many tax collectors. And the Pharisees came, the religious rulers of the day, and they went, why is he eating with them? Why is he calling them? Why is he one of the disciples? And the disciples were kind of like, I don't know. So they go to Jesus, and he says, give them this message. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. But here's the thing I want you to see for today, though, is that what Jesus was saying to Matthew is, he's saying, hey, my message is different than the religious rulers of that day, and probably some of the ones in our day. That their message was, oh, you can, be, you can follow God, but you're going to have to change first. You're going to have to get your whole life straight, and then you can get your life on track. And Jesus is saying, no, it doesn't work that way. I love you right where you are, Matthew, and I want you to come follow me now, and then your life will change. It's not that change isn't important. It's important the order. You follow me, and then you'll change. What we see in Matthew's life is this. You want to get your life on the right track? He was going without knowing. He's like, Jesus, I don't know how to get my life straight, so maybe I need to clean all the way up, and then I can come and follow you. And Jesus is saying, no, it's the exact opposite. You come follow me, and I'll help you get your life on track. The last example I want to give you today, it comes from the Apostle Paul. At the end of the book of Acts, he's one of the greatest apostles, and he shared the gospel with all of the Gentiles, not just, uh, not just the people in Israel, but he went out and he shared it all over the world and started churches. And at the end of his life, he had had a dream to go to Rome. And you read in, in Acts chapter 20, it says that everybody begged him, and they said, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, right? Don't go to Jerusalem because there's people that are there to get you. But it says in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, he says, hey, I feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to go. I have no idea what's going to happen to me. I just know that God wants me to go there. And he got arrested. And Paul went to Rome, but he went in Rome in chains. (laughs) And you think, man, that's not exactly how I thought. I thought I would be preaching in Rome. I thought this is the way life would work out. I didn't realize that that's how God was planning to use my life, or is is this way God, and some scholars even wonder today, is that how God wanted to bless the Apostle Paul's life? But what we find right there is this, is that Paul went to Rome in chains, and what did he do? He ended up ministering to the guards that were next to him. And some of Caesar's own household, as a, as a result, some of Caesar's own household got saved. But even more importantly, he wrote many of the, the, the books of the Bible sitting right there in the prison cell. He didn't know it. They were letters. And later, the Holy Spirit used that as scripture that many of us get saved as a result. That God can use things we don't understand. Going without knowing. That God's greatest thing is surprise. When we are willing to take the next step. That we're not always going to understand how God is doing that. Now what I'd like to do with the time i got left is this. I'd like to just share personally. And then maybe it's a challenge for you as well. And I've seen this before even in my own life. That... uh, a long time ago, <laughs> that's kind of how it feels a long time ago in a galaxy far away. That's kind of how it feels to me right now. When I was called to be a pastor, it was right after my dad had died. And uh, I remember going to a church called Western Branch Community Church, and I saw a whole different way of doing church. And I felt called to ministry. And I remember going to Jim Wall, and, and we developed a plan for saying, Hey, John, maybe you should start a church. Maybe God's calling you to do that. And I really thought I would. And then my life fell apart. I just remember that. And when my life fell apart... Uh, I got very bitter and angry, and, and I didn't understand a thing that God was doing. And I remember, I remember, I, I went back to church. It was several years before I went back to church, and and but my son was young, and he was he was in preschool at the time. That tells you how long ago he's in his twenties now, um, but he was in preschool at, at the time. And I remember going, hey, I need to make sure he stays in church because maybe I don't, but I, I want to make sure that he's going to church. So I, I take him, and maybe some of you guys, you do that for your kids, and you're like, man, I want them to have that, but I don't know how I feel about this right now. And I remember leaving the service being so critical. And I was I basically, me and my mom, would, my mom went with me to church and, 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 me, and we would take my son and drop him off and then we would sit. And then afterwards we'd go out to eat. And I remember that day we went out to eat and I was just railing the church and being so critical about everything in the church. And I remember my mom saying, well, John, you know, it sounds like you have a lot of ideas. You know what I think you should do? I think you should take the next step. I really do think that God has called you. I had no idea why she would say that. It's like after everything I just said, but she said, you know what? I do believe God's called you, John. So here's what I think you should do. You keep talking about doing it 
and you, you know you need to finish up your degree. So here's the thing. Why don't you start? And I was like, nah, I don't really need to do that, right? I made every excuse in the world why I couldn't do it, right? I don't have enough money. You know, my wife's own, Marie had been sick at the time, and it just wasn't a good time, and I'm working, and, and I'm living with my in-laws, and, and I just don't think this is good. And she's like, I, I do, right? And I'm like, I don't have the money. In fact, we were in debt up to our eyeballs, and, and there was no possible way I could go back to school right now. It doesn't make sense. And besides, I'll never be a pastor. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> and she said, here's what I'll do. Why don't you fill out the application, and I'll pay for the application fee. And let's see if God doesn't answer your, your prayer. And I was like, Mom, I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I remember saying that to her. But I did. I, I, came, I came, and I didn't fill out the application yet. What I did is I went to a trusted advisor. I had gotten some help with my finances to figure out the horrible decisions I had to make with my finances. I went to a Crown Financial Counselor. and uh, They didn't have financial peace back then. And so I went to him, and I said, hey, you're not going to believe this. My mom wants me to go back to school right now. And I don't have the money for even the first class, but she wants to spend her money on an application fee and then trust that God is going to show up, I guess. And uh, he said, you know what? I think that's a great idea. In fact, I'll pay for your first class. I thought, you've got to be kidding. I went to him to, to say, this is a dumb idea, right? I thought he was going to just uh, agree with me and he didn't. And, and I signed up for my first class reluctantly. <laughs> and, and that week, when I, when I got my application back and, and they accepted me, we received a check in the mail that didn't pay off all of our debts and stuff, but it gave me enough money to pay them back and to be able to go to school and to finish my degree. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say it was an easy journey. I'm not even going to say that, that I was full of faith and everything's been great. And, and, and even in the other people's lives, Abraham and different ones like that, there, nothing was perfect. But here's what I want to tell you. I started that class and, and I received a check the next week for the amount of money I needed to go back to school. And I took a two-year degree, and I crammed it into four years. <laughs> it's a very rough time in her life. I remember I remember sitting in, in hospital rooms with my wife when she was very ill, and we didn't know if she would make it, finishing up some of the class, and she was encouraging me to do it. And I kept thinking in my mind, how is this going to work? I, I can't imagine that I could ever use this. And, and by the time I graduated from college, Marie started to get better. And then... I got a phone call from a pastor that I was so close to, Jim Wall. And you know what he said to me? He said, hey, are you still thinking about planting a church? This was after I finished the degree. And, and we started talking about planting a church in Isle of Wight, and I guess the rest is history. And it happened over 10 years ago, we planted a church. <laughs> Isn't that something? And God used all of those experiences. But here's what I know. If you don't take the next step, if I didn't take the next step, it would have all ended right there. <laughs> So here's my question for you today. In fact, I want to ask three of them for you today. For you. What is God calling you to do? That's number one. The first question I want to ask, and, and this is in the notes and you can take a look at it, but it's this. What is God calling you to do? In fact, I want you to ask it personal. What is God calling me to do? Do you know? Have you ever asked him? Or are you simply saying, kind of like I did, hey God, I kind of know what I'm supposed to do, so why don't you bless what I'm doing? <laughs> It doesn't work that way. Number one, what is God calling you to do? Lean hard into that. Maybe you've never taken the time to listen. Maybe you don't know how. Maybe you need to talk to one of us about how to listen to God. Maybe you, you're not a follower of Jesus and you're going, maybe that's your first step is to go, maybe I need to come to faith in God. Because it's hard to hear from God when you've never even received him as Savior. That God's Son is one and only Son into the world and he died for your sins and to restore a relationship with God. And that's maybe where you need to start. Or maybe you're a Christian that's been going for a while, and you go, hey, you've been holding back. And that brings me to question number two. Question number two that I want you to ask yourself, it's kind of like a probing question for yourself. What have you stopped doing that God never told you to stop? That's kind of what happened to me, you know? Hey, hey I can't pastor, right? I, I don't have a church. And you go, Oh, 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 you need a building to be a pastor? You need a stage to be a pastor? What is it you need to be a pastor, John? You need to pastor right where you are. Wait a minute, my wife is sick. You don't think I can use somebody whose wife is sick? I, I mean no disrespect when I say this to you today. But here's what I want to tell you. Are you, take, are you willing to take the next step that God's calling you to do? See, it's not the final step. It's not saying, hey, I'm already there. But are you willing to take the next step? What, what have you stopped doing that God never called you to stop doing. You know what I'm saying? 
Is there an excuse for why you couldn't continue in faith? <laughs> is there an excuse for why you couldn't continue to do what God called? Maybe, maybe you got sick. Let me ask you a question today. Can God use somebody that's sick? You know, maybe it's something smaller. Hey, I need to go check on my neighbors, but but I just don't know if I have enough time yet. Here we are in the middle of a pandemic. Now is your time. You see, I can't do it because there's a pandemic. You see, I can't do it because I have hard, my finances are are, are, are not right. I can't do it because I, I lost a loved one. And I, and I mean that with all due respect, but here's the thing, guys. Some of us, we're never going to have what God has because we stopped doing what he called because it got hard, but God is still with you. And I'm not saying what's happened in your life is good. What I'm telling you is this, that God can bring good out of whatever circumstances you're in. What have you stopped doing that God never called you to stop doing? And the third question is this, what step, what step do I need to take? What is my next step? What is the next thing I need to do? That's the ultimate act of surrender to God. Hey, I don't know how this is all going to work out but I'm going to take the next right step. You see, some people are thinking, hey, I'm not going to do it until I have all my ducks in a row. And let me tell you something, that's never going to happen. You follow him and then you'll change. You'll follow him. He'll resource you as you go. Maybe you needed to hear that today. <laughs> you see, Abraham didn't have all the direction. <laughs> the rest of the guys that I told you today, Joseph and, and Matthew and, and the apostle Paul, they didn't have the knowledge, right? It said they, they were going without knowing. But they took the next step. Let me tell you something. It all stops right here if you don't take the next step. What is your next step? And will you take it? <laughs> we have a verse for this series that I just want to share with you real quick. It's Romans. And I think we're ready for it now. I think I thought if I read it at the beginning, it just might not have made too much sense. And, and we might all went, ah, I just don't know if I can agree with that. But maybe at the end, this will make more sense to you. It's Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Paul wrote this at the end of his life. I told you he was in Rome in chains. And he wrote this. It says, And we know that in all things God works together for good, for those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. He didn't say all things are good. He said, I can work all things together for good. Here's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to pray for you. We have so much more we would like to share in this series, and we're going to share it. But for today, here's what I'd like you to do. Would you wrestle with those three questions? And especially with this, what is your next step? Will you take it? <laughs> if you've never received Jesus as your Savior, this would be the perfect day to do it. If you stepped away from faith, maybe it's time that you step back and do what God is calling you to do. Okay, can I pray for us today? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today. Lord, these are not always easy things to hear. Lord, you call us out of our comfort zone. You call us no matter, like when we look at the life of Abraham, it, that sometimes people think, hey, my life is over because I'm, I'm over 65. And the truth is they're not. Some people think that and they're younger than that. It's like, hey, man, this thing hit and, and now my life isn't like I thought. And maybe they're a young adult and life is just not going or the world's just not going like they thought. But you still have a plan. And I'm playing. They lean into that today, God, because while I don't believe everything in this life is good, I believe you can bring tremendous good out of it. And you have a purpose and a plan for their life. God, I pray that they find it. God, I pray they'll listen to it. God, I pray they'll answer the call. I pray for maybe for the one today that they go, no, I, I don't really know Jesus. And today, Lord, they'll, they'll take the first step. Not the last step, the first step to come to know you as their Savior. They'll receive you today. God, I pray for the Christian that maybe he's been straying long enough. They stopped doing something that you never asked them to stop doing. And I pray today that, that they'll, they'll pick that back up and that you'll show up in a mighty way. And Lord, for all of us, here's what we realize. It's to your glory. And that's what we pray today, that you receive all the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, John, for sharing that. And also, thank you for joining us today. It's been great having you here. I've enjoyed our having conversations with some of you in the chat and looking forward to seeing many of you online this week in our community groups. And a reminder, if you're looking for a way to get connected to other people right now, we have all kinds of community groups happening virtually. You can join via video or just call in with a phone. 
Best way to get connected with one of those groups if you're not there yet is just go ahead at this time and above this video or below it, click on the word groups and you'll fill out a form and from there we'll be in touch to help walk you through the process of getting connected to one of our virtual groups. Well again, thanks for joining us today. Have a great blessed week and know that we're here for you. We love you. We're praying for you. God bless.